Okay. Uh, we're on page 63. We'll begin talking about Noah as a preacher of righteousness. Uh, note again that Peter says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2 and verse 5. And once again, uh, this student, and the student here is Justin Rogers, who wrote this particular part of this. Some of this is taken from his commentary uh, that was unpublished but that he wrote on the book of Genesis that he allowed me to use whenever I was teaching uh, the, the fellows last, last year, last fall. It talks about, uh, this refers to the content, the uh, term righteousness here refers to the content of Noah's message. Uh, in other words, he, he taught righteousness. He preached righteousness. Now, that doesn't mean that he was not himself. It says that he was a righteous man in chapter 6. But what he preached was righteousness too. Here's a man who walked the walk. He, 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 he lived what he taught. Uh, the term from which uh, we translate righteousness refers to integrity, virtue, purity of life, uprightness, correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting. And this is the meaning of righteousness as Peter uses the term. And this is what Noah was preaching to his contemporaries who had corrupted their way upon the earth, according to Genesis 6 and verse 12, uh, to the point that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continuously. Genesis 6 and verse 5. Noah was preaching a righteousness which is according to faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Uh, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I want to look at that passage just a little more closely. There is something here that I think is important. Uh, when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, uh, there is verse 8 along with verse, uh, verse 7 that I think is important. Whenever you begin to think about the idea of faith, here you have this uh, wonderful chapter that has all the heroes of faith. And Noah is mentioned by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen. In reverence, he respected God. He prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world. So apparently those who were not in his family were, were condemned because they did not believe his preaching. And he went out not knowing excuse me, uh, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So he was an heir of righteousness as well. It mentions Abraham. It says by Abraham <clears throat> him when he was called, obeyed. Faith and obedience are always closely rely, rely on each other. It is not enough to say, I believe one must also obey. And I talked a little bit yesterday about the obedience of faith found in the book of Romans at the beginning and at the end. Uh, one of the passages that I think the New American Standard does so well with can be found in uh, the, the book of John chapter 3 and verse 36, the last verse of John chapter 3. And uh, I, I like pointing this out because of John 3.16. And there's nothing but faith that is mentioned there. Now, if you have a King James Version, this will not make sense to you. But if you look in your, if you look in your literal word app that I've talked to you about, and you compare the two phrases that we'll look at, you'll find that the word for believe in the first part of it is not the same word as the word that comes a little bit later, which in the King James is translated does not believe. It's actually the word apitho from that word. And it means a person who is not persuaded and is nearly always translated does not obey. The ESV and the New American Standard both translate it this way. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And that's an important point. I was online one time uh, on a Greek, uh, I was on a Greek list where everybody was studying Greek and, 
And the question was brought up by one of the fellows who was on that list. Many of them were people who have a Calvinist background. And he was wondering why the New American Standard translated that way and whether or not that was an accurate translation. Well, one of the guys that was on this list was one of the foremost uh, scholars, Greek scholars in the United States. And he said that is a correct translation. He used the word does not obey. And uh, if you go into some, something like your Bauer, Art and Gingrich and Danker, that, or my, it's Bauer, Danker, Art and Gingrich now, uh, which is the best lexicon available today, uh, the idea of does not obey is really what is in this, this particular word. I just wanted to point that out, that faith and obedience are so closely aligned. And uh, the newer versions get it right. They get it right here whenever they say does not obey because that's what the word means. Now, the word believe is always a package word. When someone is to believe, it's not just saying that they have mentally agreed with God, but that belief is that word that refers to the whole concept of somebody who is someone who will follow after God, someone who lives for God. It's not just believing. It's that whole life is dedicated to that faith and they are going to follow the Lord Jesus and be obedient to his will. So whenever we think about words and we run across that word believe, the phrase believe alone or only believe, the idea that faith alone saves is never contemplated in scripture. It's always one of these ideas where faith is a comprehensive term of our response to the Lord Jesus Christ, and not just faith by itself. Yes, Dave. That's the point. Bill, on that, I mean, uh, evidence to that is at least John twelve, where the Pharisees believed mm -hmm. uh, what they want to say because they, they didn't follow. And then, of course, you will know James uh, uh, two twenty eight twenty nine, where the demons believe. That's right. Belief is an all encompassing, as you're talking about, it's all encompassing commitment and obedience. Yeah. One of the more, more clear passages, that's a good one. In John 12, 42 and 43, the passage that you're talking about, you have many of the rulers believed, but they were not confessing him. They didn't want anybody to know it uh, because of the Pharisees, that, and they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue because they loved the approval of men more than the approval of God. And, and that's the concept. So they're, they, they, they knew what was right. They knew what was right, but they weren't willing to do it. And uh, God did not approve of them. Even though they had faith, God did not approve of them. Here was a situation where anytime you have that word faith, the idea of obedience is in the middle of it. And I, I wanted to point that out because I think it's such an important point in dealing with people. The other passage, Galatians 3 and verse 26, uh, for you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Then comma, for as many of you has have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. The idea of believing in Jesus, the idea of being baptized is just naturally thought of that. There is no passage, there is no idea anywhere in the New Testament which talks about somebody who is a saved believer that this is an unbaptized person. That just is never considered, never contemplated in Scripture. A faithful, be a, 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 a faithful believer, that's... But I, I think you understand, a true believer is always one that has been baptized. Uh, whenever you have 1 Corinthians 7, what talks about the person being a believer or not a believer, you're talking about baptized people. People who have been washed, sanctified, because he says that in, in the chapter just before that. They're washed, sanctified, and justified. Anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to mention that because I think, it's, I think it's an important point. Uh. Noah was preaching a righteousness which is according to faith. He built the ark. He showed that his faith was real. Uh, it talks about the time appointed was still far in the future, 120 years. There was no natural indication that such a flood would take place. The experience of mankind was against it. No living man had ever seen such a flood. And the profane and the wicked scoffers of the age uh, they they weren't taking much on that. They they weren't uh, thinking very much about that. Uh, I think it's in 
if I'm not mistaken, isn't it Matthew 24 where it talks about uh, how they scoffed at Noah? I know it was in the words of Jesus toward the end of the toward the end of the chapter. Now these mockers, yeah, Matthew 24, 38 to 39, according to Jesus, were paying no attention to Noah. Rather, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them away. Now, in fact, when they did hear some of what he preached, it probably caused great resentment toward him because they were corrupt. And he was preaching righteousness, which includes purity of life. And no wonder they felt condemned. In fact, he condemned the world, Hebrews 11, verse 7, both by his lifestyle and by his preaching. And anybody who lives the righteous life and preaches righteousness will be mocked and will be hated by those who disagree with them. And uh, uh, it's a sad fact, but it is, it is the way of the world. The world always hates to be shown. The evil hates the light, John 3, uh, verses 19 and 20. Uh, and so they very likely resented him greatly. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian who died in 104, even says, Noah being grieved at the things which were done by them and being displeased at their counsels urged them to change for the better their thoughts and actions. But seeing that they did not yield, but were mightily mastered by the pleasure of evil, fearing lest they should kill him, he departed from the land with his wife and his sons and the women whom they had married. Uh, I think God was there protecting him. I don't know that he was, I don't know that it says he was ever afraid, but they certainly did not like him. And so the same kind of thing. Mentions down there about the sin of drunkenness and various problems that take place. Nearly half of the motor vehicle fatalities each year come because of alcoholism. In fact, alcoholism is the third leading cause of uh, lifestyle related to death in the United States. And uh, I don't think that Noah, if he had known all of the problems that would have taken place because of his drunkenness, uh, would have wanted that to take place, but it did. And there are a lot of times, you know, you, you look back in your past and you say, I, I should never have done that. I wished I hadn't done that. And you wish that things had been different and had been better. And unfortunately, uh, once something is done, it becomes reality. And as much as you wish you could take it back, it's hard to do that. Uh, drunkenness is everywhere in Scripture condemned. Drunkenness is always wrong. It's always wrong. There's never any place in Scripture that speaks of drunkenness as being something that's virtuous. Okay, we're going to be in chapter 10 now of Genesis. And uh, we're going to be looking at the table of nations here. It's interesting that even in the beginning of chapter 10, he talks about Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which is always the order up to this point that has been given. But if you look in verse 2, he starts talking about the sons of Japheth. Why? Because Japheth actually was the oldest of the three. He was the first one that was born. And uh, that takes place um, in that particular thing. I mentioned at the top of the pages of 66 that the table of nation records many things unknown to today since they declare many facts that were early in the history of mankind and, of course, the inspiration of Genesis ensures the text to be correct, even though we may not understand every detail. And there is an awful lot in this chapter that we simply don't know. All we know is what has been told in the chapter. We don't really know uh, much more than that. And while languages between various clans differed, we should not be surprised that the intermixture of the clans through the hundreds of years often meant that Shemites, Hamites, and Japhethites could eventually understand one another. We should be reminded that Koine Greek was understood by much of the known world in the days of Jesus. Now, you can go to a lot of places in the world, and they speak English. 
It may not be as refined as the English we speak, or it may not even be the same uh, vernacular as we have, because Australians have different phrases than we don't have, and people in the Great Britain have phrases we don't have. You know, I, uh, diapers and napkins are not the same thing in America and in other places. And so there's various things that people go through and phrases. Uh, I remember when we went into uh, Minsk, Belarus in 92 and 93, especially in 93, we had a number of translators. And all of these translators were very, very interested in uh, all of the slang words, the colloquial words that we used. And so we were very careful while we were there never to use words that were colloquialisms or slang because they wouldn't understand them. You have to be an American to understand what, what you're doing, or you had to explain what the word meant. And so we were very careful about our language. And uh, we spent a lot of time with the translator uh, because they were very hungry to know what these slang words were. And they actually had a book that had American slang words in it. And most of it was from Chicago <laughs> and from others. And these were not common words that most Americans would speak, but groups that would live in Chicago and Boston and, and California that they would speak. And so it, I, having grown up in the middle part of the country and not knowing a lot of those words, uh, we kind of shook our head and said, well, that's, that's not how we speak down here. <laughs> you know, it's just different, just different. So, yeah, the United States is really uh, a melting pot of the world. And, and uh, having traveled northeast, south and west and northwest and northeast and southwest and southeast, I've been in a lot of different places. And people do not. Th there are some differences in the way people talk wherever you go. Uh, I'm very sensitive about my own speech especially on TV, because I do not want to sound like I only come from one part of the country. I want to sound more Midwestern where anybody can appreciate it. And of course, coming from Oklahoma, I'm closer to the Midwest than, than most. Yes, ma'am. It's actually a culture shock for a lot of people because what's considered rude here in Georgia and Washington state would be considered okay. Whereas what's considered polite here would be considered as rude. For instance, don't call me ma'am. I, I am from Washington State. I despise that term mm. with a passion. I would rather be called a miss or a missus. But because I am in the South, I acknowledge that that is common. Yes, and it's not meant to be uh, pejorative. It's not meant to put you down. It is actually a term of respect. And that's the thing that, that sometimes people think. And, and but this is where, you know, this is the table of nations would have created this very kind of problem between people. I don't understand you. And so whatever you have, you ever I'm we had a we had a young lady who was Russian work with us at, at Concord Road. And when she was talking to her family, she would speak in Russian. And if she was alone, that was OK. But if she were talking to them in public in Russian, people would think, well, are you talking about me? I don't know what you're talking about, so I think you're talking about me. And it was, it was offensive. Well, probably it was something that had nothing to do with you. It probably had something to do with homework at home and stuff like that. But, but you see, this, this is the thing. When you don't know somebody, it is very easy to be offended by differences in culture, differences in language, differences in the way you did. And this is what makes this table of nations more than just a language barrier. There is also a cultural barrier, barrier as, as they moved into different parts of the world. You dress differently if you live in a tropical region than if you live way up north. You're going to think differently. You're going to think like the people that you grew up with think, and they may think differently than another culture would think. And these clans, while they had some similar background, would have very quickly begun to develop their own way of thinking and their own way of doing things. Now, anybody that's ever gotten married marries somebody uh, that doesn't think exactly the way they think. That's an understatement. 
well, at our house, we do things this way. And at your house, you do things that way. And you better learn to adjust. And you better learn to compromise a little bit in things that don't matter. And it doesn't mean that one is right and the other is wrong. It's just that they're different. That they're different. And that's, that's an important part of family life, is learning that not everybody thinks alike. And if we wanted to start about our extended family, everybody's got weirdos and, and people in their extended family that you think, can I really be kin to that person? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I have an older brother that calls and he wants to talk and he will tell you what he wants you to know. And when he's done, he says, goodbye. <laughs> I love my brother, but he, he sometimes uh, a little strange in what he thinks about. But he thinks because I'm, I'm the other person in the family that's had a little education that I can understand what he's talking about. And sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And, uh, uh, well, that's neither here nor there. But, but, but those kinds of things happen even when people who are very close to one another from a genetic standpoint, whenever they began to go and start their own ways of doing things, they're going to be very different. Uh, you can look at the difference between a Jacob and an Esau, twin brothers, same mama, same daddy, same birthday. But boy, look how different they were. And that, the, the, the reason for that is that there is a spirit inside of each of us that is God-given. God is the father of spirits. And I've talked about this more than once, of an earthly father, earthly mother, but the spirit that's inside of us was given to us by God. And that spirit is not just like the other spirit. We're all different. We have different uh, ways of thinking and different ways of acting. And uh, you could see why these, some of these clans uh, would really get angry at one another. Let's remember that whenever we start talk, talking about nations, we're talking about small nations, more like uh, almost like a, a city that has a king and everybody that's in that kingdom is really just surrounded that city where the palace is and all of that and not, not really much farther out. And that's why in ancient times you had so many different kings. Is that why in some, some Bibles, not all, but in some they say tribes instead of nations? Yes, it is. And, and in some cases, for instance, in the book of Revelation, you have that phrase found in chapter 1, and then you have it found again in chapter 5, where it talks about tribes and nations and tongues, all three. Use all three. And sometimes it is that way. There are a lot of things that are, are like that. Uh, when I was in Ghana, West Africa, uh, I was in the city of Kamasi, and three times I've gone there to teach in school there. And that is the, uh, that is the place where the king of the Ashanti tribe was. And, of course, in, in uh, years past, you had your various tribes throughout Africa, and many of them, of course, there was sometimes conflicts between them, sometimes not. There were many problems of this and problems of that. Today, the thing that they say that is the problem has more to do with what religious group do you belong to, not, not what tribe do you belong to. And uh, if you keep up with any of the news of Nigeria, the uh, people who are Islamic to the north have been attacking, and this has been happening since many, many years, the Christian people and killing them and, and various other things, and they've had a hard time getting that stopped. Uh, most of this is to the north. In Ghana, West Africa, the northern part of the nation has more Muslims, whereas the southern part of the nation has more Christians. The Muslims of Ghana are more moderate than the ones that are in Nigeria. And so they don't have as much trouble. But many of the, many of the tribes that are in Africa today have more to do. Their collection of power sources have more to do with their religion than it does with necessarily their genetic background. And so it's, it's that way. Um, I live in a state where we have 39 tribes. 39 tribes, Indian tribes, were taken to the state of Oklahoma. Trail of Tears, if you know about that in 1837 and all of those things. All of them have their own nation, but they still think of themselves as their own tribes. And uh, uh, each of them have their own capitals. Each of them have their own governments. Uh, and the reason there are so many casinos in the state of Oklahoma, more than Nevada now, is because each of these tribes are competing one another for the casino money. <laughs> Just a fact. And the state of Oklahoma has nothing to say about it. 
Now, they do collect taxes on profits, but they have nothing that they can say because these tribes are now each of them sovereign nations, and they have their land within Oklahoma. And the reason why there are casinos in some other states is whenever this tribe, this sovereign nation, purchases land or owns land in another state, they are in charge. So what you're talking about, really, we see some of the same kind of thing even in America among Native Americans where if you're of this tribe, you're of this tribe. And the fighting between the different tribes prior to the coming of Europeans to this country was huge. Now, the Europeans didn't do them any favors, but there was an awful lot of fighting and fighting between the different tribes in, in North America and in South America and Central America uh, long before, long before uh, the Europeans came on the scene. And, uh, but uh, how how the Europeans who came to this country, North America, treated the Indians was often very shameless and not to be, uh, not to be considered some great virtue. Uh, he mentions while languages between various clans differed, they, do had some, they did have some ability to communicate. You know, even, uh, who was it? Was it Sacagawea uh, was able to learn a little English was it Sacagawea who learned a little English and was able to, uh, yes, uh, help with Lewis and Clark? And then, and then who who was it the uh, the young lady that was uh, whenever they came over in uh, 1612 and, and that first Pocahontas? Yeah, she was over in England for quite a while, and and uh, she was quite the captain that she was with. And Captain John Smith, is that right? Yeah. Okay need to get back in my American heritage and history. But, you know, people can learn languages pretty quickly. And there were always some who were a little more talented in being able to pick up a language quicker than others. Um, Canaan comes from the line of Ham, and yet the Canaanites of 2000 B.C. were speaking a West Semite dialect, of which Hebrew itself is a subdivision. Uh, they were able to kind of communicate with one another. And this is the reason why when Abraham came, he could do some communicating with uh, some of the people who were around him. Uh, 10, 8 to 10 indicates that Cush, the father of Nimrod of Babylonia, uh, he was that father, and yet the name of Cush became associated later on with Ethiopia. Though we generally think of this son of Ham to be Ethiopic, yet the Al or Amram tribe of Arabia calls the region of Zebed in Yemen, uh, which is on the oh down at the bottom of uh, of the Middle East. There, it's not down in now in Africa, but rather in the Middle East. My brother's been to Yemen; I have not. Was also called Cush. Uh, there's also an important city near Babylon named Kish, uh, from which Nimrod may have come. So some of the names that are mentioned in this table of nations is not talking about places that are here or there that are far away. It could be very close to each other. They didn't move that far real quickly. Eventually, they ended up in another place, but it didn't start that way. So in this section, there are several paragraphs which uh, briefly treat the development of the history from the new beginning after the flood to the call of Abram. And the purpose of this material seems to provide the reader with essential background information about Abram, upon whom the record will next focus. And included in this section are a record of the generations of Noah's sons, and is sometimes called the Table of Nations, an account of sin and punishment at Babel, and two successive genealogies leading up to Abram. So here you have this really Table of Nations about the three sons of Noah, and they're wanting to connect it with Noah before we get to Babel and their separation. But it does really tell where they settled, because until the Tower of Babel, they all stayed together. And so he says, these are the records of the generations uh, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and the sons were born to them after the flood. And he mentions Japheth first, uh, where Gomer and Magog 
and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras. That's a lot of sons. And he mentions the sons, who these sons were, various ones. Uh, get down to verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. Uh, the sons of Cush were... Now, notice that Canaan is li listed last. He may have been the youngest son. Uh, the sons of Cush were Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ra'ama, and Sabteca. And the sons of Ra'ama were Sheba and Dedan. Now, Cush became the father of Nimrod. Now, we'll learn about Nimrod whenever we get to the Tower of Babel. And he became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, that apparently was a phrase that was uh, said about him, and it's recorded by Moses. Uh, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Shinar is mentioned in the Old Testament several places, and Shinar is that area around Babylon, uh, which later would be Babylon. Yes, he would have been. He would have been the king. He would have been the leader of that particular area. And kingdom is anything but a king. Right. Uh, he was a mighty one. That phrase mighty one would have been probably because he was a warrior, may have been a warrior, because he was a hunter. Maybe he had uh, the use of the spear and the arrow really down well. And so he was a, a, a great leader. But that's where that would come from. Thank you. That's a great question. I see that they don't mention the females in the sequence. I, and I've always thought about that, that the, the girls would still be born in between these. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, many times the women were not given the place that they deserved. Uh, it was not until the days of Joshua and days of Moses that the law began to say that if you had only daughters and there were no sons, that in order to keep the uh, the land in the family that the daughters could inherit the land. And that didn't happen until the time of Moses. Uh, it was not that daughters did not make difference, but usually daughters were uh, made the wife of somebody and they would leave the family to go and be with whoever they married. And so uh, there is a sense in which a daughter would be given sometimes a certain amount of this or that if she, not, she did not marry. But you'll remember that one of the responsibilities of the firstborn son in a family was to take care of all of that family that was not connected. If there was someone who was not marriageable, if there was somebody who was ill, if there was somebody who had various types of things, that the firstborn, the reason he was given a second portion of the inheritance was not because he was better than the others, but because of the leadership place that he had in the family. And he would have to take care of all of that part of the family that nobody else could take care of. You know, he was the one that was responsible for grandma whenever, <laughs> whenever dad died and, and those kinds of things. So he had a responsibility that the others did not have. And, uh, uh, but that, that was the reason uh, for, for that and why he would be given that. I, Joshua, excuse me, Justin Rogers gives quite a bit of written information about these particular individuals and where they ended up later on. Uh, I have no reason to doubt Justin. He's a pretty good scholar. And, uh, uh, but even Justin very frequently will say, we think this is where it was. And the fact of the matter is nobody really knows for sure. This is just the best guess. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that's hard sometimes to deal with, you know. Uh, we'd like to have an answer to every question, but sometimes we don't have one. Uh, Magog would be places to the north, and Madai would be the Medes, he mentions. Tubal would be the type, Baranians, 
and uh, uh, of people who lived in Eastern Asia Minor, which we think of today as, as, as Turkey, and uh, various others that would have lived there. And if you'll notice as you live, read through this list that there are a lot of situations where people didn't live that very far, very far from somebody else. But if you look on some of the ancient uh, maps, you'll find that there were far more nations than we generally think there are. You know, the, the barriers between these nations, uh, the, the, those kingdoms were much smaller. Uh, we, we think of nations always being real big. Uh, but even the United States, let me tell you what, every state has its own sovereignty in America. And there's a whole lot of difference between you Georgians and us Oklahoma people. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, somebody will tell you I'm an American, then they'll tell you what state they're from. And that's, that's okay. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the way it is in our world today. But those, those countries, those nations that are being talked about in this table of nations, you know, we're not talking about a great long distance between one and the other. In some cases, you have, uh, I saw Cyprus mentioned, and sometimes Tarshish will be mentioned, I think, somewhere in through here in verse 4. Um, some of the places that would be a long way away, but some of them were quite close. Some of them were quite, quite close. And let's remember the known world at that time was not huge not big like it is today. How long it took for people to come and whenever Siberia and Alaska were joined together, how long it took for them to cross over and how long did it take for them to go south so that they got out into Central America and South America? I have no idea. I don't think it was hundreds of thousands of years like some would suggest. I think it's probably been within the last six, 7,000 years. You know, we... we if the earth, if, uh, if they're right, the world has been around for around 6,000 years, if the Jews are correct, and Bishop Usher is right, not much more than that. And so uh, uh, since the flood, if the whole world was condemned, you know, in the flood, except for the eight people on the ark, then we're only talking about it happened since then. It happened since then. So these are some of the things that take place. There are quite a number of, of statements about various people. Uh, talks about uh, Nimrod, verse eight, 15, talks about Canaan, uh, various things, the territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza. Gaza would be to the south. And, uh, of course, uh, Sidon would be far to the north, Tyre and Sidon to the north there along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Gaza would be down where it begins to aim toward Egypt, down toward the bottom uh, there next to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and then he says, as you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, then you have uh, Adma and Zeboim. There were five cities that were destroyed. I don't know. I'm trying to remember about Lasher, but there were five cities that were destroyed in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Those two main ones, but there were three others that were also destroyed. Five cities altogether. And Adma and Zeboim, if I'm not mistaken, were also destroyed when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Where are these cities? Uh, some people think that if you go to the bottom of the Dead Sea, that you can find the remnants of some of these cities that were destroyed at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. I do not know. And I'm not suggesting to you that I do know, but it was in that, it was somewhere near that area. Yes, Carl? I still think the Knights show up a lot. The Levites, the Amorites, the King, but that oh. the Knights was. That well, that's just, uh, that's just our English way of saying like uh, somebody belongs to this group. Uh, like a Corinthian would belong to Corinth. A Semite belongs to that group of those who are from that area of people uh, that's that's all it's just a it's a way of determining the people who belong to that that group no no that's that's more of an english thing than it is a uh it would be the people of that that family or that group uh, but yeah it uses that phrase a lot uh, 
you have the sons of Amram, two sons born to Eber, verse 26, Joktan, father of that, and on down various others. And so you have uh, all of these people. These are the Shem. And Shem is mentioned last. First it is Japheth, then Ham, and then Shem. And I think it's important that Shem is mentioned last uh, because, of course, Shem is the one through which Abram would be found a little bit later on. Uh, verse 32, after he's talked about all of this, their languages and by their lands and according to their nations, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies by their nations. And out of these nations were separated on the earth after the flood. And so there was all this thing, this list of different ones that were in various places and uh, who they were kin to, uh, various things that had, they had to, to deal with, uh, a lot of information. Uh, but there's an awful lot that's just lost to history. On page 70, after the earth was divided, if you'll notice in verse 25, I missed this. It says, two sons were born to Eber, and the name of one was Peleg, for in his days, the earth was divided. So apparently it was during the days of Peleg that the earth was divided, and we'll talk about that in the, in the Tower of da Babel in just a little bit. But it, it was, his name means division. And uh, that kind of a, okay, if you're going to have a name, sometimes your name is according to what's happened whenever you were that, that, uh, that way. I, I think American Indian names often have things that whatever some event takes place, this is what the name means. And, uh, kind of interesting uh, that people would name their children after an event of life. He mentions lost in history. Many of the nations mentioned in chapter 10 of Genesis are obscure. Many others have not survived to the modern day. Although we possess only the names of many nations and know nothing of their significance in history, we can appreciate the anonymous contributions they made to shape the ancient world. Our faith is much the same. Many of our churches were planted by anonymous Christians uh, hundreds of years ago. There's no written record of his deeds, no university or preaching school in his name, and no proof that he even existed, save the fruit of his labor. How many churches have baptized countless thousands because of the work of an unknown figure who took it upon himself to teach the gospel? Like the tomb of the unknown soldier in Washington, D.C., the church has many anonymous heroes. Let us never forget our ancestors, known or unknown, and the faith that contributed to our salvation. Now, we're sitting in a building that probably none of us paid for. Now, we're paying for the maintenance now. But we're sitting in a building that probably none of us, maybe you did, Russell, I don't know. Yeah. But you think about how many buildings across the country were built by people, and we don't even know who they were. Somebody's grandfather, great-grandfather. Some of them much older. I was up in Kentucky back in uh, uh, late October, early November. I was up in Kentucky preaching in a meeting, and we went by a place up in Kentucky where there was a church building, and that congregation was established in 1805. And uh, it was a church of Christ. Another one we saw was 1811. This was before either of the Campbells came but they were already calling themselves Church of Christ, and they knew what they believed. And uh, there were several other things that I saw that were quite interesting, that were quite old. And yes, they had some of the church records, and you can see names, but we wouldn't know any of these people. They were just people that wouldn't know the names. My grandfather's name was William Lee Sanders, and he died in 1918 on September the 8th. Uh, I have been to his grave. The only time I ever visited was when my grandmother died, and she died when I was uh, in college. And that's the only time I've ever been to my grandparents' grave. 
Uh, it's down a good way south of where I grew up and uh, in a city called Juanette. And uh, uh, I did not know my grandfather's name until about 10 years ago or so, maybe 20 years ago, not more than 15. Well, about 15 years ago, about when I learned his name. I thought his name was Ben. And I told a story about my grandfather and called it Ben. And my grandmother's name was Rebecca, but everybody called her Becky. So I called it Ben and Becky. Well, it wasn't Ben and Becky. It was Willie and Becky. My grandfather, William Lee Sanders, was born in 1867 in Alabama, just north of Auburn, out in the country. He... Uh, his family moved to Arkansas in the 1890s, and he voted in an election. My dad would tell this story. He voted in an election when he was one day before the age of 21. He voted illegally, and his vote turned the election, and he was afraid somebody would find out, and they would get after him. So he went to see some relatives up in Oregon, and uh, there's some Sanders who are in the tree business up in Oregon. And uh, then later on, he drifted back and he wandered through Oklahoma and found my, uh, my grandmother and married her. My father was born in a Saudi. This is a sod house that was built in Oklahoma in various parts of Oklahoma because the trees that were there were not straight like they are here, nor were they all that beautiful. They were crooked oak trees that were not suitable for building, made wonderful firewood. But anyway, they would build their houses. And if you got land in the land rush, you had to improve the land. And they built a house that was 12 by 12 out of mud bricks. And then on the inside, they would take plaster of Paris and cover the walls. And they really were very beautiful on the inside, but they were mud ugly on the outside with that old red clay and um, uh, a tin roof in a fireplace. Uh, my dad was born in a Saudi, and I have a lamp in my house that was burning the night that my father was born. He was born in 1906 in Oklahoma Territory before Oklahoma became a state. Now, I tell all of that because I never knew my grandfather's name. I didn't know my great-grandfather's name. I had an uncle whose name was Hill, and I think, what a name for a first name, Hill. Well, his grandfather's name was John Hill Sanders, and that's where he got his name. His real name was Elmer, but I think I'd have gone by Hill. I was named Elmer. My father's name was Oliver, but he was better known as Harley. He was supposed to be Harley Oliver, and they named him Oliver Harley. Then in the 1910 census, it was Harney, H-A-R-N-E-Y. And I thought, good news. <laughs> Somebody couldn't write or spell. But, uh, you know, you look back into history and how many things are lost. And uh, I, when I turned about 55 and 60, I wanted to know about my family. I wanted to know where the Sanders came from and who I was kin to because I didn't know. My dad was 45 when I was born, and his dad died in 1918, and so there just really wasn't much reason to look way back into the past to find out who my family was. I found out later on that my grandmother had three brothers who were in the land rush of 1889, and all three got land, and that's how that family came from Kentucky to Oklahoma. And so there were a lot of little things that were interesting. But you see, who you are a lot of times is made in decisions by people who lived long before you. And the reasons why you do certain types of things or certain types of things don't appeal to you and various other things sometimes is because of a decision that was made two and three generations back and is still affecting you in ways that you don't always understand. Sometimes you'll have one generation that does things and the next generation is going to be just the opposite. And they hate that. And it was not because they liked what the first generation did, but because they despised what the first generation did. And so you have a lot of things like that taking place in families.
And history is lost. And it's lost for a lot of people. And if I had not gone into Ancestry.com and begun looking up things, I would never have known about my father's family or my mother's family. And there were a lot of things that uh, took place about that. My mother had a grandfather who was uh, the sheriff of the county in uh, the state of Missouri. And uh, there was a guy, this was shortly after the Civil War, there was a guy came through and pistol whipped her. My great grandmother pistol whipped her and uh, stole some items, items from the house. Well, one of the things that he stole was my great grandfather's gun. Well, my great grandfather was the sheriff and he was out somewhere and he saw somebody that had that gun and he knew who, where he got it from because it was his gun. Well, he pulled his pistol out and shot the man dead right there and then. Just killed him. Of course, he was sheriff. And nobody said anything. He was never prosecuted for it. But I think that was probably a little... Uh, guy should have gone to jail. He shouldn't have just shot him dead, but he did. But you know, that's the way things are. Sometimes you look at your own family and you look at your background and some things that you see are not really what you want to know. And the Bible is honest about such things. It tells us not only the things that we would like to know, but tells us some things that we don't want to know, like the situation with Canaan. We don't know what Canaan did to Noah, but he did something. And the idea was that it was not nice. And so uh, we'll leave that at that particular point. Okay, we're going to stop here unless there are some questions about all of this. Uh, there's a lot of material in, the, in this. To me, this is uh, important to know about, but yet there are so much that we don't know. It's pretty hard to do much teaching about it other than some of the things that are more clear. And we'll take a break, and we'll start again at 2 o'clock. And this will be probably our last class period at 2 o'clock. We'll get out by 3 instead of 4. Uh, that way you can go home and take your nap because I know you're tired. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll take a break. And, uh, okay. When, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So there is precedent for sitting down when you teach. Okay. Matthew chapter 5. <laughs> There's also the statement whenever he is in the synagogue at, uh, at Capernaum, where whenever they're reading the scripture, they're standing. And then he went and sat down. And I, I was so confused by that the first time I ever heard it or saw it, thinking, well, well why is he just now beginning to talk after he sat down? <laughs> well, uh, they sat down in Moses' seat. And uh, when I was in the, the uh, synagogue in Capernaum, they had a Moses' seat there. Maybe it was Capernaum or maybe it was Nazareth. Maybe that's where it was. But it's one or the other. Uh, they had Moses' seat, which was next to the door. And the synagogue, as I was mentioning, that you have the door here. And looking out of the synagogue always faces Jerusalem. And next to the door, you'd have Moses' seat, which would be in the middle of the room. Then you'd have kind of, not stadium seating, but a lot of times you'd have rows around the edge of it. This room, all the, the, the chairs on the edge, that's where everybody sat. And uh, they had a little room off to the side where they kept the scrolls. Uh, the room that I was in, in uh, the Capernaum synagogue, the one place, the one place in all of Israel where we were, where we could say, we know that Jesus was inside this room. We could not say that about any place else, but we knew that he was inside that room teaching because it talks about his being in the synagogue of Capernaum. How did we know that was the same synagogue? On the outside, you could look down at the bottom and it had a basalt foundation, which is a stone that comes out of the vol volcanoes of that area years ago. And it was a very dark color. Whereas in the third or fourth century, they, the Jews rebuilt that synagogue and they had it in limestone 
And so you had one foundation, and then you had another foundation on that. They would build on the same foundation. So we know it was the same place. And that's how we knew that and in Capernaum. And it was really quite an interesting place. If you look in any, any book that talks about that, they always have this picture where they have the things. And the, the, we were there. And uh, not all that big a place. But the uh, Moses' seat was an actual seat where he would sit. And it was kind of elevated where everybody could see him. The children sat on the floor and the older folks sat on the outside. and. Uh, he began to, to preach and teach. Anyway, uh, the reading of the scripture, you stood. But whenever it came time to preach, they sat down. Now, I've known some preachers that sat when they preached, and so I'm going to sit. Man. It's biblical. Okay, we're going to look at the tongues and how they were confused at Babel. Uh, the chapter starts out, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. This tar, according to uh, uh, Justin Rogers, is kind of an asphalt type thing put those, uh, those bricks together, but they would make bricks and they would make it from the clay that was in the, the ground. I know that uh, there are parts of Georgia that has that red clay and in Oklahoma in the middle section, the central part of Oklahoma is nothing but red clay. If it gets on your house, it never comes off. If it gets on your clothes, it never comes out. And so you don't want to go swimming in one of those muddy ponds and uh, that kind of thing. But it, it, it was brick that they used for stone and built this tower, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, you'll remember that what God told Noah and his sons were, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. They were not supposed to stay together. They were being disobedient by, let's build a tower and, and uh, we'll, we don't want to be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Well, the Lord came down to see the city. Now, this is, of course, uh, kind of a figurative statement. The Lord is everywhere. But he was focused on this place. And uh, he looked at the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, behold, they are one people. Now, they built a tower that could reach into heaven. So it was pretty tall, pretty tall for their period of time. In ancient times, there were three heavens. There was the heavens where the birds fly, the heavens where the moon and the sun and the stars are, and the heaven where God dwells. Whenever Paul talks about going up to the third heaven, 2 Corinthians, uh, this is what he's talking about. And uh, they wanted to reach up into heaven, make a name for ourselves. Well, the Lord comes down and he looks around and he says, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And it wasn't what he told them to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Uh, you know, they, they'll just do whatever they want to do. You know, it's not like God's word means something to them. It was really impossible for them, not in the sense that they could not do it, but they were not supposed to do it. Nothing will, nothing will stop them. They'll do whatever they want to do. And so uh, what does he do? He says, well, come, let us go down. Notice that there's the word us there. Let us go down. Let us make man. Uh, who is the us? Well, I think that's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Some would include the host of heaven, but I don't think that's necessary. Let us go down and there confuse their language 
so that they will not understand one another's speech. Well, if they couldn't understand each other, it's very obvious they were going to have to go find their own place. And this is how he started it. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So it was a situation where he did that in order to scatter them. And God, God said, well, you won't do what I told you to do, so I'm going to kind of push you along. We're going to get this done. And so he had to go to some pretty uh, extreme situation in confusing their languages to get, to get them to do it. Uh, people can certainly be rebellious. Now, by scattering these clans, these families, uh, this is, in my judgment, where uh, differences in physical ways began to start. I really think the Tower of Babel has more to do with the different races and the different ways of looking at things than anything that has to do with other things. The other things really uh, do not suggest that. But I do believe that when you had groups who go here or go there, that certain traits in those clans became to be more prominent. And this is where we have not only the confusion of the language, but also we have the separation of the nations and separation of people. And uh, to me, this seems to be a much better passage to define how the different groups of people uh, genetically and other ways began to separate themselves from each other. Uh, and there's not a stain here, like some people would talk about the curse of Cain, Canaan, and that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's just something somebody made up to uh, justify their misbehavior. I think this is something where everybody really was at fault at this point. There was no, no one individual. It was all. And so uh, that's my opinion. I don't. I can't prove that. That's my opinion. It seems to me that this is a much better place if we're going to say, well, where did the differences in the races begin? Whether it was Asian or African or Caucasian or whatever, uh, this seems to make more sense to me than any other single thing that takes place in the scriptures, uh, where one trait would be more dominant in one group of people than another trait, and so. Uh, uh, that's my thinking, and, and I, don't, I don't have any proof of that, but it seems to me this is a much better way of talking about these matters than by doing them another way. Uh, of course, whenever he scattered them and they had confusion and division, they had to stop building. They couldn't get along with each other because they couldn't talk to each other. It's not they hated each other. They just couldn't get along with each other. And so you had one group went one place, one group went another. And the table of nations is where they ended up after this division took place. So again, we've got the, ta the table of nations. And then, okay, how did this come about? Well, this was the cause of their division. This was the cause of their confusion. Um, the very phrase Babel uh, has this idea of confusion. Um, the whole idea of Babel, there are some people who think Babylon and Babel uh, have a lot of similarities. The Babel was Babylon. I don't know whether that was the case or not. I think some people think the Tower of Babel maybe was in a different location not far from there. But you have this confusion that caused the division. And the Babylonian word Babel meant gate of God, what the word meant. Uh, the writer is not necessarily giving a historical etymology, but probably merely calling attention to the fact that the Babylonian word, Babel, can be understood to have a disparaging significance in the language of Israel. In their misguided attempt to secure for themselves a famous name, verse 4, these rebellious people succeeded only in obtaining a name in Hebrew uh, that's kind of shameful because of the confusion and division. Uh, the Lord scattered them. Uh, 
they thought they were going to build a gate to God. But what they ended up uh, doing was very divisive and not good at all. So God accomplished his purpose, and the conclusion of the paragraph uh, informs us of that, that the people scattered. He confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. And I guess there were people as time went by that did make it to Siberia and come across to Alaska and then come down. Uh, what is interesting is that, uh, of course, the Mormons suggest that they had a group of people who came to this country uh, back before the time of Christ. But whenever they have tested any of the Native Americans genetically, they find that their lineage has more to do with the Asian people than it does with uh, people from Israel. Yeah. Um, these people of Babylon, were Hebrews? No, they were. They were all the children of of Noah. They they would have they would have all been the same at first, but they had their families. And I suspect the way that it was, these sons went to different places and became their own nation or tribe. A tribe is always family-based. And that's true almost always. There, there's kinship. It may have uh, come down through generations and there will be a lot of cousins, but there's always somewhere back in the back of that tribe uh, a patriarch. And so what you have is these patriarchs that are mentioned in chapter 10 go this place and that place and they establish their own nation, their own place of dwelling, and their own government, uh, their own way of uh, their own their own system of rules and laws and such. And uh, uh, in my judgment, what we're looking at here is yes, at one time they were all together, but they were all of the family of Noah and his wife. And and of course, you have the wives of the sons, which would have brought in some things that would be different. But as, it, as they began to spread out, they began to have different characteristics that would be family characteristics, but would not be like the cousins would have. I mean, that's right. That's right. It was also culture. It was not just, not just in the way they looked, but also the way that they began to, to do. And as time went by, there would be certain values and priorities they would have that the other clans didn't have. And so that's what brought about really the, the, the table of nations and how they were different. And of course, the thing of it is, is one of one group would look over another group and say, you know, this was after hundreds of years and time went by and they're doing real well and we're not doing so well. So let's go attack them and take what they have. <laughs> I, I can't imagine any war at the basis of every war is somebody has something we want and we're going to take it. We're going to take it. And that's true in every society and every place. It's always something like that. And uh, to be an aggressor is, is, is not, not really all that great. To be an aggressor is never, never approved of by God. And the, the unfortunate thing is, is you've got an aggressor and then you have a defender. And uh, uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion uh, about the United States. We were a, a rebellion against the, the nation of England when we began. And uh, uh, was it because we were trying to throw off the tyranny of England? You know, that, that part of it is one part of it. But there's another aspect of this that I'd like to bring out before we quit on this. Turn with me the book of Jeremiah. Since we're talking about nations and the forming of nations, Jeremiah chapter 18 Anytime somebody talks about a nation coming about or this or that, I like to remind them uh, of Jeremiah 18. Uh, anybody who has studied the beginnings of the United States of America is surely struck by the tremendous, the tremendous uh, Christian principles that were inherent in the people who established this country. I don't mean that they were perfect people, and I don't mean that they always believed exactly what was right. But whenever you think about the uh, 
the papers and the documents that were in the beginning of this country, it was written by people who had very strong Christian principles. Verse 7, Jeremiah 18. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. Now, so now then uh, speak to the men of Judah against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, you know, and he talks about their need to turn, turn back to God. But God plants nations. I don't believe any nation can ever exist without the blessing of God. And I don't think any, any nation can continue to exist without the blessing of God. And I think that's, that's a very important point. There were lots of things that took place in the establishing of this in any nation that were bad, 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 and were wrong. And uh, I wish that they had been different. But at the same time, one of the things that is so interesting is that if you look in the history of some of those colonies, they called on time of massive prayer to God that God would help them to establish this nation. The first Thanksgiving prayers were very interesting, and we don't quote this part of it. But whether it was in the Massachusetts group with the Adams or whether it was down in Virginia with the others, you had situations where they were praying to God, and they were praying, and while they prayed and asked God for his favor, they were also confessing their sins and repenting of them, and asking God to forgive them, and I am quoting now, through the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ. We're not taught that in school, are we? This was prior to the revolution, the Revolutionary War. So there were men who had some very strong things. Uh, if you read the federal papers, uh, that were written by several of the founding fathers. The single most quoted book, more than all of the other books combined, was the Bible. And much of what was built in this country as a uh, federation, as a, we are a republic, not a democracy, but a republic, was built upon many of the, the teachings of the scriptures. And, um, uh, that's worth knowing. There were things that they did back in those days which created problems for us later on. The Native Americans were mistreated. The people who came over here as slaves were mistreated. And those are things that are terrible and wrong. My great-grandfather, whose name was John Booth, not John Wilkes, but my great-grandfather's name was John Booth. My grandfather's name was John Lige Booth. They fought for the North and not the South. And I have records of how they were paid. Uh, a, a, uh, whenever they retired after the war was over, they were given in their old age, an old age pension from the United States government. There were an awful lot of people who fought for the North in order to free the slaves. And I'm thankful they were willing to do that. Amen. It was a wrong thing to do. There were a lot of the founding fathers, especially from the South, Washington, Jefferson, uh, Patrick Henry, others who had slaves. In those days, if you bought land, the slaves actually belonged to the land. In other words, when you bought a piece of property, along with the property that you bought, all of these slaves came with it. It was part of the economy, and many of the founding fathers hated slavery, and many of them predicted that it would take a war before it could end, and it did. 
and it was a terrible it was a terrible thing in our country. But let me say that whenever you have nations and you have divisions and other things, all through history you have terrible, terrible things. I'm thankful though that uh, that there were people who were willing to to make things right, even though it took from 1776 to 1865 before they began to make things right. And then, of course, since 1865, not everything was right even after that. Many, many problems. We need to love each other. And if there is anything that the Tower of Babel and other things teach us, is that Jesus is the source of our unity. I don't care who you are. If you follow Jesus and I follow Jesus, and we both obey him, we are brethren. And that's what makes us one is our faith. That there's something bigger than the past in those things. Jesus unites people. He doesn't divide them. And I have little patience with people who do not respect everyone who loves Jesus. When people began to think of their background and they don't like this person or they don't like that person, when that person has become a Christian, they are brethren, and they should be treated as brethren. They should be loved. There aren't many churches that are like Warner Robins, although I can remember back in the 80s living in Mississippi, and there were many things that I saw that I'm very much ashamed of back in those days. I came from Oklahoma. I went to school with people who were Indian and people who were African and people who were white. In my from the time I was in the eighth grade. And um, I, they were fellow classmates. I never thought much about it. When I was in college, my roommate, Harold Redd, who is a preacher in Memphis, Tennessee, a very well-known man, very highly loved. He was the best man at my wedding. And Jackie and I were the first ones to ever eat in his home after he married. And we've been close ever since. When I think about all of those things, I did not grow up with the idea somehow or another. I knew that there were differences that were cultural and other things, but you loved everybody if they loved Jesus. Never thought anything about it. It's interesting that the table of nations separated, but the day of Pentecost brought everybody back together. And it's the gospel that brought the Jew and the Gentile back together. In heaven, there's going to be people of every tribe and nation and tongue. And that's what makes the difference. And it's because of the blood of Jesus that made a kingdom of every tribe and nation and tongue. And I'm thankful for that. I have been in Russia where there was atheists and agnostics. Most of them were not the militant atheists. They didn't know anything about Jesus. They had never had a New Testament. We gave away New Testaments in 1992. They didn't have it. I have been to Africa to train people. I have trained people in Korea and in the Philippines. And I have been to Canada. I was in a church in Canada where there were people from about 15 nations, South American, Asian, African, all kinds of places all in one place. And I tell you what, you can go to California or you can go to Florida and there'll be people from 20 nations in many of the congregations all worshiping together. And I'm thankful for that. When I was young, people didn't always worship together. But you know what? I have probably been... In the last 13 years, but I have been traveling throughout this country. I haven't been in more than three or four congregations that was not mixed. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. I know that uh, this maybe has nothing to do with what we're talking about with the Table of Nations, but I, I think it is important to recognize that if scattered at that time. 
that the wonderful thing about it is that Jesus brought them together. The day of Pentecost was an amazing day. And uh, I think of Paul. I said, well, okay, to the Jews, if you're not going to listen to Jesus, then I'm turning to the Gentiles. And he did. And I'm thankful that we live in a time in which one person can sit in his own room and teach people anywhere in the world. Aren't we living in marvelous times? Amen. Uh, I, I was preaching in by Zoom in South Africa last, uh, not yeah, last summer. Last summer I did. I'm supposed to do it again sometime this year, and I'm thankful for that. The program that I'm on goes out into 30 nations of the world besides the United States. And these are the kinds of things that I think are wonderful because they are inclusive of people. We need to be people who love others even when they're hard to love or they're different. Different doesn't necessarily mean right or wrong. It just means different. Now, one of the problems we have is that some of the inclusiveness of today is a moral kind of problem, and I, that's a different story. Yes, sir. How did they Tom. receive you? How did they receive the word in other countries? You know what? I hear from people. I've heard from people from three or four continents. I get, I get email and messages continually from Colombia and from Guyana, from Belize from Jamaica, from the Bahamas. I've gotten messages from all of these people. They can see our program there in the places I've mentioned. Uh, we, we cover the entire Caribbean. And they love what we're doing. They write very, very strongly. They're so thankful that we're on TV there. Uh, we hear from Canada once in a while. We hear from all 50 states from time to time. We are on in all 210 television markets and other places. And it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to speak to so many people in so many different places. Um, and God has opened up that wonderful door, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. But when you, when you think about the fact that Jesus unites people, there is no message of hope and peace and love like the gospel message. Amen. And when you want to teach righteousness, but you teach it with hope and peace and love, people will listen. And uh, uh, you don't have to compromise what you believe or what the Bible teaches if you teach with the right attitude. And I teach things that nobody else is teaching online and on the air. And yet we haven't been canceled except in Baltimore. And um, okay, so I started off in the Mousin Church, talked to them, and found out that the Mousin Church actually started off from the Church of Christ in the, in the first place, but because it was looked down upon to be called Church of Christ, and plus a lot of fighting happening, um, they actually used the word Mousin instead of Church of Christ for their title. And then I heard from my, I heard, I heard through the grapevine, that the Church of Christ is now arising again. And I was wondering, since you said that you were in Seoul, um, does did the Mousin Church and the Church of Christ, do they recognize each other? Or how they rejoin each other or anything like that? When you talk about, am I hearing the word Malcolm? Mousin. Say that one more time. I have, I have a problem hearing. It's not your fault. <laughs> Um, I guess the closest way to spell it would be L A, well, the M A S M A L S U M, but it's oh Maslin, something like that. Uh, um, Maslin. But it's it was one of the founders of the Muslim Church is a Church of Christ member, and they weren't able to use the title of uh, Church of Christ back then. So I was just curious if maybe they've form together or not, but clearly you don't know. <laughs> I, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Uh, this is something that's more local with you that I, I really don't know about. I do know this. I was down in Dasher, not far from here, and I was given a paper that talked about a restoration movement that sprung up in Dasher, yeah. Georgia, 
that was completely separate from anything that took place with regard to what I saw in uh, what was then Virginia, up, up where Alexander Campbell is buried and where he had Bethany, Virginia. Now it's West Virginia. That's up just north uh, in that area. I have been to his house and saw that. By the way, the church building that Alexander Campbell preached in, in Bethany, Virginia, has the words Church of Christ on it. It doesn't have Christian church or disciples. It has Church of Christ. Uh, there are a number of different movements that all came together in those early 1800s. Several movements from this one and that one. There is no, you know, I, I don't like the idea of a founder. There's only one foundation of the Church of Christ, and that's Jesus. And if it's not built on him, it's not the church that I'm a part of. Oh, I don't really mean like founder. I, I, under, I understand. But there had to be somebody who was doing the first preaching yeah. for that area. And I, I understood that's what you meant. But uh, And that's that, that's it. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that I, I don't know. There's a lot of history that is involved in some of this that I'm not completely aware of. But the things that I do know is that the idea came right out of the scriptures themselves. What happened were people were beginning to read the Bible for themselves rather than listening to their denominational people. They were so tired of all the bickering between the denominations that they kind of decided, well, I'm just going to read it for myself. And they began to see that what the Bible was actually saying was very different from what these denominational groups were saying. And so they began to go back and say, okay, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And that was the real driving force. That is the restoration plea, going back to the Bible, doing Bible things in Bible ways and calling them by Bible names. Amen. That was the real, real beginning of, of what we think of. But most of it was from the word itself. Now, the seed of the kingdom, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 the seed that causes anybody, that imperishable seed, and I like the word imperishable because it doesn't matter whether it's the first century or the 21st century. The imperishable seed that causes the new birth is the word of God, the gospel that was preached. First Peter 1, 22, 23, all the way down to 25. And if you corrupt the seed, you have something different. But if you preach the pure seed, you can only have the same thing you had in the first century. So what they wanted to do was to go back to that pure seed. And whatever the seed taught in the first century is the seed that is taught to make churches today. Whatever caused a person to be born again in the first century is the same thing that causes a person to be born in the 21st century. And if you'll notice, that was the gospel which was preached to you, but it's an imperishable and the word of the Lord will endure forever, verse 24, and then verse 25, and this was the gospel, the good news that was preached to you. So he defines very specifically in that passage, I do believe in what's called pattern theology, that the scriptures themselves set a pattern for how we should worship, for how we should organize, for how we should do, how we should live, uh, how we should be baptized, uh, what repentance is all about. The, the scriptures themselves is the pattern by which we must follow. If we follow that pattern, we will be the same kind of church that they were in the first century. If we do not follow that pattern, then we cannot be the church that Jesus established. We become a human, a hybrid, part divine, part human. And we don't want that. We don't want a hybrid situation. We want something that's pure. So it's really important for us it's really important for us to know the scriptures well and to be able to think through them. And uh, uh, I, recommended, uh, I recommended the other day this book by Edward C. Wharton called The Church of Christ. And he talks about the distinctive nature of the church. One of the things that I find among many preachers in more recent years, especially from some of our uh, universities that have become a little more progressive, is they no longer teach about the distinctive nature of the church. We need to be teaching about the distinctive nature of the church. There is a difference between the church that Jesus built and these human churches that have their own organizations and their own ways of worship and their own morals in many cases that are not scriptural and not come from God. And so being distinctive is not some small matter. It's a big matter. 
And uh, uh, that book does as good a job in describing the distinctive nature of the church as any that I know of. And it needs to be taught again and again and again. And I don't know, I'm thinking about if I come back next year actually teaching the distinctive nature of the church and talking about that with, from that book, using that as a, as a textbook. Um, I just think it's that important. Yeah, I think it's that important. Yeah, Edward Horton is a marvelous fellow. He uh, has been a, a teacher at uh, the Sunset School of Preaching for decades. And he's been somebody that everyone has respected for decades. He's a good, good man. And while uh, any type of uh, group sometimes are good and sometimes you shake your head, but here's a man that you can look at and say, this man. He believes the truth. He believes the truth. Okay, in the latter portion of this chapter, uh, from 10 to 26, we have another genealogy that is produced. And this is the genealogy, uh, a lot of it of, of Shem. Now, we had a little bit of that uh, earlier in chapter 9. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to jump ahead. These are the records. There's that word Toledoth. Now we're talking about Shem here. Uh, he was 100 years old. He became the father of Arkpakshad two years after the flood. And Shem lived 500 years after he became the father of, of this fella, and he had other sons and daughters. And uh, Arkpachshad lived 35 years, became the father of Shelah, and Shelah became the father of Eber, and Eber became the father of uh, Peleg. And Peleg, this is a different Peleg than the one we talked about before, uh, lived 30 years, and he became the Did you notice that they're having kids a lot younger? Became the father of Ru. And uh, Ru uh, lived 32 years, became the father of Serug. And uh, Serug had other sons and daughters. Serug lived 30 years, became the father of Nahor. And uh, Nahor lived 29 years, became the father of Tira. And uh, then Tira uh, became the father of Abram. And another Nahor that we find later in the book of Genesis. Ten generations from Noah to Abram. Ten generations from Adam to Noah. I thought that was quite a little interesting thing. Uh, Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. We used to tell a joke years ago from the American Standard Version, uh, which was eight, eight sons did Milcah bear. Milk uh, there. Never mind. That was a bad joke then, but it was funny whenever you want. You know, you'll laugh at, laugh at things when you're young when you won't laugh at them when you're older. You laugh at things when you're older young. I know. Uh, dad jokes. One of my sons in law asked for a book of dad jokes. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his grandson and Sarah his daughter-in-law his son Abram's wife and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan and they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. And that's the way that ends. And all of that, of course, is brought to bear because Terah was the father of Abram. And so this is how we get introduced to Abram. Ten generations from Noah. But you notice how much faster a period of time that was. We're not talking about a huge amount of time between one and the other. Uh, uh, only a few hundred years instead of, you know, over a thousand years. So... Well, it, it would not if if you yeah if you look on a map, it's in what's called the Fertile Crescent, where they would have come out of 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 Ur of Chaldees would have been south of Babylon, 
and they would have come up to Pandanaram, which was at the top of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, it would have been to the east of Turkey, uh, the northern part of what we think of as Iraq. Yeah, it, what is interesting is that other than, than Israel, you know the country that is most referred to in Scripture is Iraq? because Babylon and so many things there uh, is very frequently mentioned in scripture, but that would be at the top of the fertile crescent and they would have gone up because it was desert if they had gone straight West. So they had to go North and come South. This is a reason why almost all of the invading people, they either came from Egypt from the South or they came from the North, even though they might have lived East, they came from the North because they had to go up to Father Lowe's rivers in order to be able to survive. And uh, then they would come south. But you're talking about uh, if you went 20, you know, if you meant 20 miles a day, which would have been about as much as a group could go, uh, you're only talking about weeks. You're not talking about a terrible long time. You're talking about hundreds of miles, not, not, not thousands. It's not that far. You know, you, you think about Jesus his whole life, uh, was spent, except for the time he was in Egypt, his whole life was spent only within a few hundred miles of where he was born. And so uh, you would take, if, you, if they went from Caesarea by the sea down to Joppa, uh, that was a two-day travel, 40 miles. So there, there's not a whole lot, 75 miles or so from Nazareth down. It'd take four or five days to leave Nazareth. But now, let's remember, they always went and they crossed the Jordan River and then came south, uh, bypassing Samaria, and then came back over and would come through Jericho going on to Jerusalem. That road between Jericho and Jerusalem, you know, where the, the Samaritan found the man who'd been wounded, is very narrow. And there are a lot of places on that road where somebody could hide and waylay somebody pretty easily. There are, you've got this road going over here on one side, there's a slope down on the other side, there are hills, but there are places inside those hills where there would be some places you could hide, some crags and stuff in there that they could hide. And uh, they could come out and, and, you know, wound somebody to steal whatever they had pretty easily. So, uh, you know, the things you read about in Scripture, if you know a lot of the geography, all of it's true. They always went up to Jerusalem. Well, why? Because Jerusalem was in the mountains. It wasn't down. It was up in the mountains. No matter where you go, you're always going up to Jerusalem. And uh, people would travel from continents to go there. Alexander the Great or the Babylonians or mm -hmm. whatever. Greeks, or even the Romans, who came from that little small island of Rome, of, of Italy, came from that area, came across to conquer. That was a that was a, that was a mighty feat back in those days. It, it really would have been. It would have taken several weeks for them to have accomplished that. It would not have been an easy an easy task. Uh, they could go through Constantinople, and it was a brief crossing of water. They wouldn't have to use the water. They could, but they would a lot of times take ships. And they could land at, uh, of course, later on, Caesarea by the sea was a port that was built in honor of Caesar. And that's why it's called that. Uh, but uh, uh, that was not a natural. Joppa was the only place where they could go and, and land for a long time until they built this port at Caesarea. Otherwise, you'd have to go up to Tyre and Sidon. And uh, uh, lots of... Uh, Interesting things when you think about the people of long ago and how much they went to. Uh, I was talking about the Magi in class last Sunday morning. We were studying from Luke, or I guess that was Wednesday night before I came here. And the Magi came from, they may have come from as far away as Persia. We don't know where they came from, uh, Persia, which would be Iran, or they came from the Babylonian area, which would be still. But they traveled for weeks. It was a long travel for weeks for them to get from the east to Bethlehem. They were following that star quite a while. 
It wasn't a brand new thing, which I thought was quite interesting. And of course, that star led them right to Bethlehem and uh, settled there. Well, I've run out of gas, and I think we've run out of text. Uh, the story of Abram and Isaac and Jacob, and then Joseph is a marvelous story to read uh, of the lives of these men. But Abraham in chapter 12 is now the person that God focuses on. One of Noah's great, 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 great grandsons through Shem. And uh, he becomes somebody that is the focus, he and his family, the rest of the book. And even to this day, we think of Father Abraham. Yes, Father Abraham. He's father to all who believe, Galatians chapter 3. And so uh, we think of him. But this book is a marvelous book of beginnings, of origins. And um, for those of you who are taking the class for credit, uh, there is a test and uh, exam. Basically, it's a kind of like short essay. There are 12 questions, and I ask for a, a paragraph on each of them, and Dave has copies of those, and we'll be glad to do that in order for you to get credit for the class. You do have to write a paragraph on each of the 12 questions. Those 12 questions come from the things that we've studied over these last uh, 11 hours or so. So though it is worth one hour of credit in GSOP. And I don't know what it's a part of as far as one of the others, but it does get you on down the road. A little bit, a little bit. That's pretty good for three days. Get an hour down the road. Takes a lot longer than that for the, the three hour courses. Okay, are there any other questions or any other comments? If not, well, we'll end with a prayer. Uh, brother.